All right. Well, I'm going to kick us off. Um, good morning and welcome to today's Take Flight session featuring an interview with Modern Woodmen of America. We're so excited to have Tim Smith with us today. He's going to walk us through uh, a little bit about a day in a life in his particular role, tell us about his industry and field, and ways that you can get connected to his office as a UNT student. Um, so I'm Jeanette Hickel. I'm the Senior Associate Director in the Career Center, and I do oversee our internship program. And I am joined by our graduate assistant for internships, Macy Merriweather. So welcome to, to everyone that's here and welcome to any of our participants as you continue to join us. So Tim, you should have um, the ability to share your screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So if you want to kick off with your presentation and I'm gonna mute everybody else as of right now. Um, so as we go through the presentation and there'll be opportunities for questions as we go through today's session. Uh, well, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Macy. And I'm um, super excited to be able to share a little about this career and about our firm. I, uh, I'll kind of get into my history, but uh, you know, there's, a, there's something about you know, the way that the job market and career world works now where uh, you don't see a whole lot of people who start with a career right out of college and uh, could confidently tell you almost a decade in that they want to stay in this career with the same company until they can retire. And I can, I, I'm proud to say that I'm one of those. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about Woodman and uh, what we do and, and who we are and, and how we help uh, other students who are just like myself uh, find a rewarding career uh, in this industry and then specifically within our firm. But uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a, uh, there's kind of two different presentations in one here, but uh, I'll talk a little about the day in the life of a financial planner. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what our internship and externship opportunities are uh, with really this presentation kind of covering three different roles, a full-time position and then a, a, a summer internship part-time position and then a, a super part-time position in the fall and spring semesters of, of each academic year. So uh, super excited to go through it. Uh, first, just kind of talk about Modern Woodman for a minute. Uh, we are a 138-year-old fraternal financial services firm, uh, $18 billion in assets, $43 billion in insurance, and about three-quarter of a million clients, or, or what we call members, across the United States. And uh, the fraternal part sometimes throws people for a loop, and I'll spend some time talking about fraternalism in a minute. But uh, the best way to sum it up is that we do our marketing, our branding, our advertising in a little bit different of a way. Uh, we do it through community reinvestment, and uh, we've put back about $53 million each year uh, back into local communities across the United States. Uh, we did about half a million in the Dallas area last year alone, uh, and uh, we're super excited to kind of talk about some of those projects and what our, our advisors and our planners are going out and, uh, and being able to do uh, with Woodman money and be able to make a difference in their local community. A few of the pictures on here, uh, the top right is a picture of our home office on the banks of the Mississippi River up in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. And then uh, you see a picture here of some of our staff down in the, the Dallas office. And then the bottom right, a picture of a service project we did out of our Plano office uh, just a, a couple of summers ago. So uh, just to kind of get a snapshot of who we are and what we do and what we're all about. But first, I you think it's probably uh, you know important for me to explain who exactly I am. Uh, so my name is Tim Smith. Uh, I've been with Woodman for eight years. I've uh, been in management for six now, but I'm actually a, I'm actually a Denton boy. I, uh, I'm, I'm from Denton. I uh, went to high school and, uh, and, and spent most of my life here in the Denton area. Uh, and uh, I didn't go to UNT. Uh, and I, uh, I'm a big fan of the, of the Main Green and a uh, big supporter of, of athletics uh, there at the university. But I went to a small liberal arts school up in Sherman called Austin College. I played football up there. And uh, was uh, actually went there at first to uh, go into the, the pre-med program, which uh, for anybody who started in pre-med and then uh, did not finish in pre-med, you'll, you'll understand my plight. Uh, but I, uh, I spent three and a half years, my four years in college, actually studying to become an attorney. Uh, didn't spend any of my time with, with a mindset for financial planning. Didn't think that insurances and investments was going to be my longtime career goal when I was in school. I uh, was a major in political science, so nothing really pointed to me being in, the, in this industry. 
I uh, took the LSAT. I was accepted a couple of different law schools, thought that was the, the direction I wanted to have with my life. And, uh, you know, a, uh, a few, you know, a few months before I graduated, I, I decided that I wanted to take some time to uh, relax between going to Baylor and, and, uh, and, and going to law school and uh, get a breather and, uh, and, you know, not be playing football full time, working full time, going to school full time. And uh, modern women found me and uh, I started interviewing with them and I did, it didn't seem like it fit with my plan. But uh, I, I kind of got an entrepreneurial spirit about myself and started saying I can go get a, a financial planning practice started, go to law school, start an estate planning practice and run those in conjunction when I graduated. But about six months into my career, I realized I found what I was wanting to get from the legal field, uh, but I found it in financial planning, which was this ability to be a resource for people, to be able to explain a really complex subject into black and white, take this gray subject, break it down to where clients understood it and they came to me for their advice and their resource. And, and that really meant a lot to me. And, and I'm glad I was able to find that in a career that didn't require me to go get another uh, quarter of a million dollars in debt. So that was, uh, that was, that was beneficial uh, as well. But uh, let's spend a, a little bit of time maybe talking about our organization before I kind of talk about the day in the life of a financial planner. Uh, we're very keen and, and, and we stress heavily our values in our corporate culture here on a local level. We really believe that every advisor that works for us uh, encompasses these three values. They're devoted teammates. They, they believe that a rising tide will raise all ships and that our senior advisors are tasked to invest into our junior advisors and that we have a lot of team planning that goes on and uh, a lot of team camaraderie that goes on and everyone's devoted to the expectations that we all have for each other. Uh, secondly, we're big believers in being relationship managers. Uh, we, we were, we're relationship-minded individuals focused on managing relationships, not managing assets. That uh, There's plenty of big clients out there that have a need for what we want, and you certainly in this industry could chase the, the big money clients. But if we manage the relationship right, we know we can make a difference in that person's life. And, uh, and all the other great stuff that comes along with being in this career, we'll, we'll, follow, we'll follow behind it. So we believe in being relation minded, not asset minded. Uh, and then secondly, or lastly, I should say, we're big believers in being valued citizens. Uh, I'll talk about that with the paternal piece in a minute, but uh, we want to invest into our advisors so that they can go out into the community and be able to be that community pillar where you know, they're running for public office, they're involved on a nonprofit board, they're, they're involved in a chamber of commerce, they're involved in networking groups, they're, uh, they are see, they're involved in their kids PTA or they're involved in the school where they're not just seen as you know, a financial planner here in town, they're seen as a beneficial community member. And that's what we want our, our planners to be in the community and where they live, uh, whether it's a demographic or it's a geographic community, whatever it is. And then all these things culminate into a very simple mission statement that day in, day out, we measure our advisors by do they impact others through the relationships they build with them. So impact through relationships is our mission statement and the thing that we hammer home and, and want our advisors to realize this is what makes you different, that you seek to impact other people through the relationships you build with them. Now we're headed, uh, we're headed in one direction, and that direction is uh, what we, we call the 2028 Summit. Uh, we, uh, we have a, a goal to do something that uh, has never been done in modern Woodman, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's been rarely done in this industry, and that is to have, have five $1 million advising teams, also known as a district. And we've got some smaller summits along the way. Uh, the Fraternal Builder of the Year Award, we won that last year. The Regional Growth Award came in second for that this past year, and I uh, have a good shot at winning it this year. And uh, we're on track to become a $1 million region this year, but uh, this bus is heading in one direction, and uh, we're looking for others to uh, to join us and to help us accomplish this collective goal that we all have together as a team and we've all bought in on. Now, what exactly is financial planning? Because that's a question we get a lot when I'm doing interviews with students. We we do get a lot of people who will ask, you know, or we'll, we'll tell them, why do you think financial planning is a career for you? And, you know, we'll have students who say, well, I, I enjoy investments. I've got a Robin Hood account. I'm in student investment group. I, I like talking about stocks. Uh, I, like, I like talking about money. I'm good with money. Those are all great. Uh, the best way to really describe what this career is, though, uh, once again, ex-athlete, sports-minded individual, uh, this business is really best broken down into an offensive and defensive side. That offensively, 
we help our clients reach their financial goals, whether it's uh, to buy their first home or pay down debt or to buy a business, to build a successful business, to be able to save for retirement, to save for their kids uh, you know, college or uh, to save for some other type of big expenditure they're wanting to make. Uh, we're trying to use investment-based products and portfolios to, to help them meet these goals, too, to help them grow their, their worth, grow their assets, reach those goals that they have. Retirement uh, is a big one for us. But at the same time, we can't just play offense and think that we're going to win the game. We've, we've got to play defense as well. That uh, Sadly, we have clients who, who pass away before they meet their goal, or uh, they're disabled, or or their, their parents have to go into a long-term care facility and they have to financially support them. And so we want to be able to play defense for our clients as well. And that's where the risk management products really come in to be able to protect families, the loss of a loved one, or protect families from a disability or protect families uh, and their assets from, you know, a nursing facility or assisted living care having to become a part of the equation. So these things really come together to really make what financial planning is. It's it's a holistic approach. We, we make sure you're never going to be poor. All the while, we're trying to make sure we reach our goals that we have financially going forward. And, and that's really what this career truly is. Now, fraternalism. Uh, fraternalism is, is a little bit weird. Uh, there's only about three percent of our of our industry are fraternal organizations and. Uh, we're really probably the oldest form of financial services firms that exist, uh, but essentially what it means is that our clients own us. We're a member-owned organization. Our members receive benefits from being the owners of our company, and we try to find ways to reinvest in our members, our clients' lives through that fraternal activities that I talked about, that $53 million a year of impact that we make. Uh, and the way that kind of comes out, here's a couple of examples, but um, you know, here on the on the left is a picture of me presenting a, a matching fund uh, check to the Denton Police Department. They used to do a, a youth summer program where they worked with kids who, um, you know, possibly had uh, tough home lives, and they tried mentoring them and developing them during the summer. And we would support them rather than the police officers paying for that project out of their own pocket. We started helping run a fundraiser and giving them money to help them uh, help them fund that project. Uh, we do service projects. Uh, an example of one right there in the middle is we, we packed a bunch of meals for a homeless shelter down in Dallas. Um, this is probably about two years ago. And then on the far right, you'll see a picture of one of our advisors going out and uh, recognizing a local middle school teacher for uh, his, his over-the-top efforts and, and volunteering to help teach a couple of students at his middle school in his lunch hour how to play softball. They, they didn't have that opportunity at home. They wanted to play softball when they got to high school. And so he took time teaching them the skills of it. And so we wanted to recognize them for, uh, for, for being an amazing volunteer and making that difference. But fraternalism at its very core really comes down to our creed that all the, all that we send into the lives of others comes back into our home. So we, we try to invest into our people so that we can, uh, we can let them do that. We can, we can let them see the fruits of their labor by investing into their community. Now, financial services, as a uh, as an industry, um, you know the, the U.S. News ranks us the sixth best business job. Uh, there's median salaries about ninety thousand dollars. Creates life work balance, all these great things. But the piece that I think is really important for college students looking at this career is the uh, the long term opportunity. Um, the average age of a financial advisor is fifty seven. Forty three percent of this industry is over the age of fifty five. Uh, and then only about 5% of this industry is under the age of 30. Uh, this industry is old, uh, you know, not to offend anybody here or anybody who might watch this recording in the future, but this industry is, is, is an aged one. And uh, we know in the next 15 to 20 years that there's going to be a lot of people who are in this industry who will be retiring. And on top of that, the baby boomer generation, as they begin to hit 65, the largest population of the meat of that generation will start hitting 65 in 2022, so next year, that in the next 15 to 20 years, those folks, as they retire and then eventually, sadly, pass away, there's going to become the greatest transfer of wealth in American history. About $30 trillion will change hands in the next 20 years. And there's a need for people like us to be able to help those inheritors, those beneficiaries to understand, here's what you need to do with that money. And here's how to best do tax planning around it, to allocate it for your goals. And so there's a need for youth to be in this industry uh, because of what's coming, as well as just the, the current status of advisors uh, in, this, uh, in this industry as a whole. 
Now, I, I think I've talked quite a bit about the career and I'll get to the day in the life. I, I promise I will. But um, this, I think this is the part that I need to take a second and just um, talk about because once again, we have students who say, I enjoy uh, talking about investments with people. I, I like talking about money. I'm good with money. This job is not just about being a phenomenal portfolio creator or uh, a great money manager. It is so much more about the impact that we have on our clients and the, 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 the types of people that we are to them in their lives. Uh, and a story comes to mind, a happy story. I won't tell any of the sad stories. I've got, got plenty of those as well, but I'll try to keep it, keep it upbeat and positive uh, for, uh, for this. But I had a client, uh, he and his wife uh, biologically couldn't have children. Uh, and so they started the adoption process and uh, they need to save money because adoptions aren't cheap. And uh, we helped them build a goal and an investment account, start saving up for the money they, they needed to have to be able to, to do the adoption process. And um, after about three years of saving and as well as trying to, uh, to get through the adoption process and to, to adopt a child, uh, they, uh, they were getting close. And I, uh, I got a call at 1030 at night on a Tuesday that um, uh, from, uh, from the husband and he, uh, I answered the phone because usually when a client calls at 10:30, it's not a good thing. Uh, but uh, I answered it, and uh, he was kind of frantic. And then um, we're, uh, I'm heading to Lubbock. Uh, there's a, a mother out there who's about to give birth to a baby, and the adoption agency has placed us with, uh, with the child. And so uh, we're gonna, we're going out there, and we're, we're gonna get the kid. And um, I just, I just wanted to make sure everything's okay. I said, yeah, everything's fine. You know, whenever. I already know that whenever the adoption, you know, paperwork comes through, I, I will get the money distributed out so you guys can get that all done and uh, everything's going to be fine. I'll, I'll start working on my end. And, and we kept talking and I could hear him rustling around the background. I said, hey, what are you, what are you doing? It sounds like you're, you're you know, moving boxes. And he's like, no, we're, we're packing. I said, are oh, you heading to Lubbock tonight? I said, yeah, we're leaving here in a minute. I said, when did you, when did you find out? He goes, about five minutes before I called you. I said, have you? Uh, and his mom's a client. I said, you, you called your mom yet? Said, uh, no, I haven't. You're the first person I called. I said, okay, man, your mom has been waiting to be a grandmother for a long time. Hang up, call your mom. I'll call you tomorrow morning. When you get the Lubbock safe, I'll call you in the morning. We'll all get everything working out, okay? So he's like, all right, that, that works. I hung up and my wife, um, she's a CPA, so she has to work with clients, but she asked me what was going on. I told her, she said, is that is that weird for clients to, you be the first person they call. They don't call their parents. They call you. It's like you know what? It's it's not because I can't. I can think of a about I don't know a dozen other times that I've had people tell me about pregnancies or, or health issues or the good and the bad in their life before they've even told some of their other you know, closest confidants or family members. And I was telling, I was like, that's just that's just the kind of business I'm in. That 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 people turn to us in those really life-changing events. And, and that's really what the impact of this, this business is, is that he needed to talk to me to give him peace of mind. And um, it's not from a place of arrogance. If really, it, it's more of a place of, of humility of, I can't believe that I'm viewed as, as this person's uh, strongest resource uh, when, when they have all these other people that, that of course love them and support them through their life in other areas. But that's what I do. That's what they, that's what they see me as. So that's really in the impact of this career. It's not about choosing the right investments. It's not about being a good money manager. It's about being able to be there for the clients when they need you the most and being that, that calming voice when the, when the wind starts to whip by them. So hopefully that, that story sinks in and gives you an idea of really the way I see this career. Now, the planning for life. Uh, our, our, our day in the life of an advisor, our advisors, because we have that mission statement, impact through relationships, uh, their job is to be building relationships with people at all times. And so um, we, uh, we use a tool called the Planning for Life that is an all-encompassing, holistic review of the financial planning model that anybody should be using in their life. It's seven key areas of planning. It allows for us to go through and begin to fact find with the clients, start building solutions for them, making the presentation back to the client to say, this is what we, we should do to be able to help you reach your goals. And then uh, continue to follow up and, and, and develop that plan as, as things change, because it's great to get it set off. But you know, people 
uh, start planning when they first get married and then they've got kids and the plans change. They buy a house and the plans change. They, uh, they have grandkids and the plans change. They begin to retire and the plans change. And so it's, it's an all encompassing, ever evolving process. But this is the tool that our advisors use to make sure that they're truly addressing every single need that a client's going to have. Now, an advisor's day, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, little bit of a snowflake in the sense that uh, no day has ever looked the exact same in my in my career for the last you know better part of a decade. Um, these are two examples that we pulled from uh, from two advisors calendars. You know, they you know, they got personal stuff in their days. They've got work things, but every single piece in here I can point to and I can see this is an advisor going out and uh, impacting through relationships, uh, meeting with a mentor, uh, working with the clients, uh, going to a networking event, going to the PTA school with the kids, um, go and, and, and be at a fraternal event, uh, make phone calls. All these things are all part of this, this impacting through relationship piece. And, and really the people who do well in this industry are the ones who they enjoy that those relationships. They enjoy having that personal interaction with people on a daily basis. We use a tool called the Today's Plan to be able to let our advisors build out what a successful day looks like for them. But for the most part, uh, our advisors do these a week in advance uh, and then refine it the night before to make sure they've got a plan for the day, as well as they can go through and assess if they feel like their day was was ex was accomplished, if they, if they feel like they got things done that they needed to, to be able to create structure uh, to the flexibility that is in this career, because clients don't always meet between the hours of eight and five. Sometimes clients work eight to five. Most times clients work eight to five. And so might have a meeting at 530. Uh, we might have a have to do a lunch down at a, you know, downtown Dallas at an office or something like that. And so having to be a little bit more flexible to meet with clients whenever they need to be met with uh, allows us to, uh, to build this structure from that flexibility. Now, I'm, I'm willing to stop down and take any questions about the day in the life uh, before I jump into the internship and the externship opportunities. Uh, and if there are none, then I'll, I'll continue on. Yeah, I can ask a couple while we wait to see if any of our audience members um, have a few. They can type it in the um, chat if they do have some questions. Um, I'm curious as to um, what kind of skills um, are needed for a financial planner. You've talked a lot about those personal skills um, and you talked about the today's plan being a part of it. Are, are there any other um, skills that are needed? Yeah, you know, I think the um... I think that, that discipline and some of these other things you probably could have picked up in the um, in the in the first part of this conversation uh, is pretty important. And the relationship skills are certainly there. If I could point out some others that I know that the you know the, the Department of Labor uh, puts out there, or the Bureau or the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics put out there about this career, um, you know, critical thinking, the ability to to think outside the box, be able to analyze and look at at multiple different points of view of the same problem is extremely important in this career because uh, we have a saying, the situation is the boss. And that is every single client, you know, might have the, might be a, a teacher, you know, four teachers that are all, they should be in the exact same scenario, but every single one of them is a little bit different because of their family makeup or their, uh, what their spouse does or uh, what their, uh, you know, the, maybe if they have health complications or whatever it is. So uh, being able to think critically and take, you know, basic underlying understandings and be able to think out the box a little bit as well. And so that critical thinking piece is extremely important in this career. And secondly, and, and maybe lastly, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll throw out there a deductive reasoning that um, if uh, deductive reasoning is the ability to take the pieces of evidence and be able to piece together the full picture, um, that deductive reasoning skill is definitely important within this this industry because a lot of times clients come to us with a brief understanding or, or a rough understanding of their their work's retirement plan or their old company's retirement plan or the insurance they get through work or the old insurance policies they have or uh, things they might have already set up at some point in time in their life uh, they might understand their expenses or their income but not always and so being able to take a few of the pieces of information they give us and be able to piece in and fill in the gaps where we can be able to build a full picture and, and that the ability to do deductive reasoning that problem solving is uh, is extremely important because a lot of times we don't get all the information 
and we have to uh, be able to, to piece it together the best we can with the information that's provided. So I would say those two skills are extremely important over and above, you know, the discipline, the personal abilities, uh, all, all that. Thank you so much for touching on those. Um, I have another question for you, and that is, what are some myths that you would want to bust about what you do as a financial planner? Sure. Um, I, would, uh, I would definitely say that one of the big myths is that you just sit in the office all day. Uh, you know, Zoom and COVID's changed things a little bit, uh, but uh, to be honest with you, our, our, our top planners, uh, they spend about 25% of their time in the, just in the office working on paperwork and and, and servicing client accounts. And about 75% of our time is, while it still might be in the office, it's it's with people or it's out in the community and it's with people. And so this is not a, a cubicle job. And uh, I think some people might have that 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 thought in their mind that while well, we're sitting here looking at candlestick graphs all day, we definitely do that. But that's about 25% of our time. 75% of our time is with people or in front of them or, or with them or we're the relationship manager or the person that they they're coming to and having these conversations with. So I think that's a that's a, a big myth that we see in the industry uh, is that. Um, I think another big myth, and this really just goes for recruiting because um, I've been in this industry long enough now and, and I've worked with enough uh, career centers uh, to, to know that uh, there's a there's a myth that this industry, and I really shouldn't call it a myth, but I would maybe, maybe throw out there that things are changing, but there's a myth that this industry has a lot of turnover and, uh, they wouldn't be wrong in some instances. A lot of this industry, some of the companies in here will um, will use um, use recruits, use students, um, you know, have them come in and then sell a little bit of something and have them move on and turn them over. Uh, the industry average for first year retention rate is about 12%. Uh, over the last four years, our retention rate is 73%. So uh, for our firm. So, um, I would maybe just throw out there that just uh, maybe if you've seen it in other other instances or read it other places, um, there are great companies in this industry that value training and development, and they value selection to make sure that they're not just hiring anybody that has a heartbeat, and the ability to pass a test. They're they're finding people who are going to be right and who are going to be in this industry for a long time. And then you know within Woodman, our four year retention rate, meaning that after they get past their fourth year they are with us for the rest of their career is 97 percent that 97 percent of the people who are with woodman for four years are still with woodman until they retire and that that to me is is extremely important in understanding that's the kind of career the kind of the kind of uh, uh company that i would want to work for um, and does kind of break away from some of the mold you might see in some of the other companies in this industry wow thank you yeah that is a really that's so cool that you have that high of a retention rate within um, your uh, organization. That's awesome. Um, and then as you get into talking about internships and externship opportunities, um, what advice do you have for students trying to find a job in this field? Are there any professional or maybe um, UNT student organizations that they could potentially get involved in? Yeah. I think the uh, I think FMA, the Financial Manager Association, is a great club on campus um, that is good for this industry. I also think the Student Investment Group, which I know both FMA and S and, and SIG are both very uh, very competitive to get into. Both are great uh, preparatory courses or organizations to join. Um, you know, the Professional Leadership Program, the PLP program, is another really great one to join that that does prepare students well for being in this type of industry. Um, but, you know, it, those those three are, are very exclusive and, and I don't want to exclude any students who can't get into those or they try and it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't work out. But if I could maybe throw out one one piece that, that uh, I've always recommended to college students, uh, broaden your knowledge, take take courses that are outside of your major. This may sound weird and you might have to add some more courses to your course load, but um, graduating with only a finance or an accounting understanding um, while it's it's great and you'll definitely have a, a leg up in those in those areas, um, break out. Take a take a psychology course. Take some humanities courses. Take an English course or writing. Course. Uh, go go take some foreign language courses. Uh, go and go and study. You know maybe some religion courses. I mean you think of it. Think of whatever uh, 
uh, outside of your major and that's not in the BLV, I would tell you to go go jump out there and, and take a few extra courses. Not a lot. You don't need to go man, you know, uh, a major in, uh, in international cultural studies or something like that. Uh, but uh, you could take a, a course or two. And the reason why I say that, this industry uh, doesn't matter which which level you're in, whether you're a, a financial analyst or you're an actuary or you're a financial planner. This industry requires you to think outside the box and be able to see the world from other points of view. Doesn't matter which level you are in this industry, you're required to do it. And if you've only ever thought in this one train of mind of, of, of finance or accounting, uh, you're you're going to miss some of the pieces that. You just never been challenged. Maybe look at the world differently and realize that you know, your finance courses, your accounting courses, stem over into your psychology courses, your sociology courses. That your sociology and your psychology courses, or even your finance courses, stem over into history courses. Or that you know your English and literature and writing courses become really important, especially when you start writing reports and crafting emails and communicating with clients. These are all skills that add into your ability to be proficient in this industry. Um, and, and it's not just about taking every single finance course that BLB offers. That's one thing that I would recommend that any student could do. It just comes down to effort and signing up for classes. Thank you so much for that advice and those organizations. Yeah. Um, I do want you to have the opportunity to talk about internships. So mm -hmm. if there are any other questions that pop up in the chat, um, I'll definitely pull those out and maybe we'll have some more time at the very end, but I want to turn it back over to you to talk about internships and externships. Perfect. Yep. So as Macy said, I'm excited to talk about these, this something that we've been doing at UNT now for, uh, two years. Uh, we've had, uh, three summers, I guess, technically with UNT students in it. And so excited to share about our, uh, our, our program as we've done. Uh, I'll first talk about the externship. Uh, this middle picture here is actually our, that was our first. Uh, UNT externship that we ever operated in the fall of 2019. Um, the uh, the spring of uh, spring of 2020, spring uh, fall of 2020, and spring of 2021 have all been virtual externships. And the externship right now does operate virtually until it is safe for us to return to campus. Uh, but uh, but I'm excited to talk about it as a as a great way to see if maybe this is something an industry I want to get into. So. What is an externship uh, is a question that, that might be going through everyone's heads. Um, it's an experiential, not clerical type of job experience. It's, it's not meant to be something where students are filing paperwork or doing a traditional internship. Uh, and it's meant to be a unique, a unique quick hit where we understand that in the spring and the fall that a lot of times students don't have time to, uh, to spend 15, 20 hours in an internship on top of studying extracurricular activities or athletics or whatever it is they're involved in working full time to be able to pay through school. Um, so we want to give them that opportunity to, to get experience, but not a high time commitment. And we have seen before that students have done internships and realized very early on the internship, this is not a career I want to go into. So it does allow students to get that taste, make sure they feel like this is an industry I want to enter into, and then pursue those those those. Uh, internships and jobs later on, and it makes them more attractive for it. <clears throat> now, what is financial services? I've, I've talked about what we do in financial planning, but financial services are all these careers. It's the financial planning advising, it's being a securities transaction principal or a financial representative doing phone work like you would with like a Fidelity or, or Schwab. Uh, investment and retail banking, actuarial sciences, uh, investments and insurance underwriting. These are all part of the financial services industry. So. We do spend time in this externship talking about each one of these careers. So the way that we structure the externship, it is three separate three-hour sessions, uh, usually in the evening. We choose a day based on consensus. Uh, in the fall, which is what we're, we're, we're interviewing for right now, uh, it's one night in September, one night in October, and one night in November. And it's three hours each night. Uh, and, and we're really looking for anybody who is going to be a sophomore, junior, or senior starting in the fall of 2020. And, the, and I've mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I hammer the point home now. This is an industry overview. It's not a modern women's sales presentation. Uh, we do this because it does allow us to find really great candidates for our internship. But we also know that there's a need for youth in this industry. And so this helps us cultivate our industry. It's something that we do to give back to the industry to be able to make it better. Uh, and then we do a phone interview which is the only way that we accept people into the externship. And that's conducted by our recruiting and marketing office here in Denver. 
Now, each session is a little bit different. Uh, the first session, so the first night in September, we cover the industry model. What does each career look like? How do you get into those, those careers? What are the skills, the education levels, certifications, designations that can come along with being in that career? The job outlook on the career? We do a personality test, uh, and then we actually spend time talking about uh, building a mission, uh, identifying your values. And between session one and session two, the homework is to build a cover letter. And uh, we talk about how to build a good cover letter. We review that in a homework session, a homework call between session one and session two. Session two, we do case studies where we break down financial planning cases. I mean, financial planner are hard. You wouldn't want me doing any type of actuarial calculations. I ain't that good at that. Uh, but uh, we can break down real life case studies. And we talk about how each of the industries or each of the careers from session one worked on these individual cases and give some real life examples of this is what this industry does. It's not just, you know, you, you know, become an actuary or an investment banker and be a financial analyst. It's what did they do to help somebody and, and be able to give that perspective to students. Uh, we usually couple that with a little bit of a finance game where students are actually getting to try out some of these uh, some of these skills and kind of a, a nice uh, controlled setting. And then in session three, uh, we throw all the finance stuff out the window and we throw, focus on soft skills. Uh, we, we know that this industry, uh, because, you know, many of these careers take lots of education, lots of licensing and studying. We want to spend time talking about how to build a goal, how to set goals, how to set small goals to reach a larger ultimate goal and be able to go through a goal setting one-on-one uh, workshop. And on top of that, we spend time talking about networking. What does networking and soft skills look like? What are the basics of those things? And, and what do students need to know about whenever they are doing that type of that type of networking conversation, small talk with soft skills? How do they make themselves better and be able to feel more comfortable going into those types of situations, which will inevitably happen in every single career in this industry? And then we couple that with a mixer. Uh, usually, we're able to do it in person. We'll do it here in town, we've gone to Armadillo Ale Works the last, uh, in, in fall of 19 was uh, when we did our last mixer, we did there. Virtually, we've been doing uh, Zoom mixers where we bring on advisors to sit in and, and be able to, uh, to, to talk to the students and, and be able to try out some of those skills. Now, there is no major requirement. We're really just looking for people who are interested in working in the career field. And then in the fall of 2021, they're a sophomore, junior, or senior, and they can commit to a weeknight class schedule. And uh, we're very serious about the class schedule. It is only three nights. Uh, and if somebody misses one session, we do remove them from the externship. Uh, we want a high commitment, uh, but a, a, a low time commitment, but a high quality commitment is what you usually describe that. And then they do have to complete that 10 to 15 minute phone interview. Now, we do have a financial planning internship as well, which this focuses in on just financial planning uh, from, that, from that externship. So, uh, as you can see here, these are our uh, two of our last uh, uh, internships. Uh, we've got uh, two UNT students down here, one UNT student here. So we've uh, we've definitely have some good UNT representation in our internships in the past. But uh, the internship, it's experiential, not clerical, much like our externship. And the way it's structured is it's five hours of classroom time where we cover you know the business development, business marketing, uh, business operations, product knowledge, planning strategies in that classroom time. And then our, advi our, our interns spend 10 hours per week shadowing our advisors in the field where they get to see real life financial planning cases in person, be able to ask advisors questions, and dive in deeper and learn what it looks like to actually work with clients. And then we do have a final project where our interns will work with a, a, a real clients with myself. They will help draw up a plan and they'll assist me in making that presentation back to that client. And then they have to build their own presentation and present it to our firm for a, uh, for review, just to let everyone be able to poke holes in it and see how they can improve it uh, but, and try out some of their public speaking skills. Now, outcome-wise from our internships, we've hired almost 60% of our internship classes in the last three years. And when we do hire an intern, uh, we pay for the licensing fees and study material to be able to get their licenses. Uh, and then we do train them if we do end up hiring them out of the internship. We spend their final semesters training them uh, to, uh, to move forward into a career upon graduation. And uh, we do pay them. So $10 an hour for 15 hours a week. And then adding in the licensing, it's, uh, it's $4,000 of value that we, we add into the intern's life within that. So now uh, for anybody who would be willing or want to apply for the externship, the internship, full-time career opportunities, we do have a QR code there. 
Uh, we also have a bit.ly link that you can uh, more than willing to uh, to complete that. Uh, but uh, that is uh, that's the best way for, for uh, anybody to apply uh, to be able to set up a time for an interview. On the application, there's a spot on there to mark what you're most interested in, full-time position, internship, externship, and then our marketing recruiting office will handle the interview process as such. So, great. Uh, and that's all I've got. So I am willing to take any other questions that are out there. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Those are super comprehensive programs that y'all have built out and they seem really successful. Yeah, thank, thank you. It was a lot of hard work, but it wasn't all me uh, to say the least. So we're super excited to be, be doing them. Awesome. Um, I want to open the chat again if anyone has any questions. Um, but I do have a couple to finish us out if nobody does. Um, so you mentioned kind of at the first half that you had a client calling you at 1030 at night. So I'm wondering how this job affects your lifestyle and then kind of how you practice self-care. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, self-care, the, the, you know, the, the mental health of our advisors, uh, not to make it seem like it's, um, it gets strained, uh, but we do take it very seriously because there are clients who um, don't recognize uh, boundaries. Uh, and so um, we, uh, we have to help teach advisors about uh, a fire to a client. It doesn't necessarily need to be a fire to you, but you need to make sure you communicate that to the client and, and having that, that time to, uh, to, to address their problems when the time is right. Um, I can definitely say that that really this career, and I think this really goes for any career, that you don't look at this as a job, you and, and you look at it as a career, and, and there is a difference between those. In my mind, a, a job is something you show up to for the paycheck. Uh, a career is a part of your personality. It's it's who you are. It's if you boil down what you love about your career, you would be doing um, those things still, uh, even if you weren't working, if money wasn't wasn't an issue. Um, I would still be building relationships and trying to impact others through the relationships I've built with them because I, I love serving others and I love people. I love relationships. Um, I would still be doing those things even if I wasn't in financial planning. It'd be just in some other form or fashion. Uh, and so I think to me, those that really do well in this, in this career, in this industry, they, they recognize that and see that this is just part of their life. It's what they do. Um, uh, you know, and then that mental health piece, we, we really do spend a lot of time making sure that our advisors are, they're not, they're not getting mentally overstrained and that they, they understand their workload uh, because you do get some people who are extremely zealous for the impact they can make. And uh, they will, uh, without knowing it, they'll start burning themselves out. And we have to do a lot of workload management to make sure that advisors don't do that. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad that y'all have that, um, that management piece to kind of take care of your uh, financial advisors who do put too much in and get burnt out quickly. So that's good to hear. Um, and then my last question for you is, what is your favorite thing about this career path that you're on? Yeah, I think the, um, it, it changes from day to day. I'll tell you that, Macy. There's, uh, I, I love the people. Um, I, uh, my wife and I have plans uh, Friday night to, uh, to go to dinner with a couple that uh, they're about to move to Colorado. We've been friends with them now for four or five years and, and uh, we've been to there. We, we're at their, we're at their, their engagement party. We're at their wedding. Uh, we were there at their, the birth of their first son. We were there for the birth of their daughter, their second, their second child. And uh, I remember talking to my wife not too long ago and um she just remembers that, you know, we started hanging out with them and going to, you know, went down to Austin for Fourth of July one summer and spent Fourth of July with them. And she's like, how did, how did you meet them? And I started realizing, I said, well, I met, I met the wife. Uh, she actually worked for the business development office at UNT um, and uh, a past BLB business development officer uh, had introduced me to her and she wanted to do financial planning for her. And at that point in time, her, her boyfriend, and then they eventually got engaged and we just developed this relationship that it was, it's not, they started out as clients and now they're some of our close family friends that we, we love spending time with and realizing that this business opened up doors and opportunities and, and relationships that are 
it's so much more than just financial planning. It's you're, 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 you're friends with these people and you, you help them in so many different ways. Um, and then lastly, I'd say personal growth. I, uh, you know, I just I just turned 30 uh, about a month ago, and I remember uh, telling somebody in the community that, and they kind of stared at me for a second and said, "You've got to be you're not 30. You didn't just turn 30." I was like, "Well, yeah, like, I thought you were like 38." I'm like, oh, okay. And and I started thinking about it, and I feel like this comp this company, this this career, this industry. Um, matured me in a lot of ways and in a lot of good ways and 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 really great personal growth and the ability to communicate manage time be responsible all these things that just have a personal growth that i'm, I'm sure i would have gotten at any other career but I, i'm i'm not sure 100 if that's the case and so but i do know that there's some things that i've experienced and gone through in my career that have de developed me as an individual that i'm really appreciative of so I think that personal, that personal development is, um, is one thing that I, I really do enjoy. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for joining us today, Tim. Um, I want to um, let the audience members know that Jeanette has put a link in the chat um, for anyone to uh, let us know any feedback that you have. Uh, for us or any other partners that you'd like for us to invite to chat with. Um, and thank you so much, Tim, for joining us and to our audience members for being here as well. Thank you guys very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, very proud and I appreciate the, uh, the chance to come and speak. So uh, more than willing to visit with anybody in the audience or any of those who watch this later on. So thank you all very much.